the owner of a large company, he said to an employee in the company, he said, well, Mark, you have been here for a year now. When you entered the company, you were just a clerk. After a week, you started to oversee the sales business. And after another month, you were promoted to be regional sales director, and then subsequently operations manager. In just six months, you have been promoted to be the vice president. And now I am about to retire. I want you to take over as the new president. Now, what do you think? So Mark replied, thank you. And the owner said, is that all? So Mark replied again, thank you, dad. <laughs> so the owner is the father of this employee who got promoted so quickly. Now let's face it, no matter how capable an employee is, his ability is still not quite as important as his relationship with the owner. And quite often, that's how the real world operates. Just look at Hong Kong, the tycoon, Li ka Sheng, you know, the richest man in Hong Kong, and his business empire, you know, everywhere is his business. Parking shop, Watson's, um, Fortress, Electricals, you know, and um, the, what, um, the mobile phone company, Three, Hutchison, you know. His son, Victor Lee, has taken over as the chairman of this massive business empire because Li ka Sheng has paved the way for his son over the years. Not as dramatic as the story I just told, but um, still it was all planned out for him to succeed and take over control. Now, fairness of play. Often we hear about, okay, we ought to be fair in this society, you know. Yes, fairness of play can get a person on the starting line, okay, starting line, in the red race. But ultimately, once you, are, yeah, once you get started at the starting line, this relationship, well, not necessarily father-son relationship, but a relationship with the right person, usually those with power in the higher hierarchy, if you want to get to the top level, right? Whether you say business, college, the government, or entertainment industry, or even a large organized church, such as the Catholic Church. I won't say Yan folk. <laughs> we are very fair here. <laughs> yeah, but um, that's how the real world operates. And actually, my seminary professor, Howard Hendricks, he always remi reminded us, he said, the first and last word in ministry is relationship. I repeat again, the first and last word in ministry is relationship. Well, see that um, our God is a relational God and his will for us is to have a good relationship within the church body. Well, not that we can build a um, relationship in order to advance our ministry career, but to be able to build up each other's lives and enjoy the fellowship together. And it is foremost important to have a real relationship with God. And um, I often said to people, well, Christianity is different to other religions. Other religions, they worship God that are unrelatable. But we worship a God who wants to have a real relationship with us, an intimate relationship. And in fact, every aspect of our faith depends on the right relationship with our God, from our salvation to sanctification. 
And now, what is the right relationship with God like um, that would enable us and the church to grow? Now, let's find out from the Apostle Paul. Today, I'm going to follow up on um, Reverend Joshua Lamb's message, A Difficult Task, A Powerful Gospel from Acts 16 last week. Who was here last week and heard that message? Okay, if you haven't heard it, I recommend you go online and um, listen to the sermon um, when you have time. There is power in the gospel, but it takes a real relationship with Christ to claim that power. Now today I'm going to share this message from Acts 19. After the event in Acts 16. Know him and then you would know power. I now invite you all to go back in time to the first century together. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. Now during the his um, second missionary journey, Paul wanted to go to Ephesus, but was stopped by the Holy Spirit, and instead he went to Macedonia. And then a few years later, later he went on his third missionary journey again from Antioch. Okay, um, where's the laser? Okay, yeah, that's Antioch. That's the base where where Paul always um, get take a rest after a missionary journey in at his um, at this town Antioch, and then he went on his journey again. This is his third missionary journey. So he went from Antioch through the inland that um, this part of Asia is nowadays Turkey. Okay. He went through this area and came to Ephesus at last. Now, Ephesus was a major city of the Roman Empire in Asia in those days. The city occupied an area of about um, 1,000 acres, or do you know how large is uh, 1,000 acres? It's about four square kilometers not counting the surrounding villages. So it's about um, the size of um, Chim Sa Choi to Yao Ma Tei, about um, this big. Okay. <laughs> well, not uh, by today's standard, it's not particularly large. Okay. But uh, in those days, it's a large city by, by, um, by the standard in the uh, Roman Empire. And um, it was one of the largest city in the Roman Empire, and it was the largest city in Asia at that time. And it rivaled Corinth in, in Greece, or it rivaled even Rome itself. And the population was estimated to be about 250,000. So it was um, about the same population size as uh, Tin Shui Wei in Hong Kong. Okay. Now, one of the seven wonders of Asian, ancient times. Yeah, I like to talk about seven wonders. <laughs> Remember last time I t when I talked about um, the book of Daniel, the seven, one of the seven wonders was um, the garden of, uh, the hanging garden of Babylon. And now in Ephesus, one of the seven wonders of the world, do you know what it is? The temple of Artemis is a huge, great temple. It was in this city. And the people who lived in Ephesus, they were so proud of it. And a whole business, a whole business empire was attached to this temple cult. And many people made their living on this um, religion. And much like, um, well, just much like people in Macau, what, what do a lot of people make their living out of? Gambling, gambling industry. Okay, and in addition to Artemis, of course, the people of Ephesus, as good Roman citizens, 
they would worship a lot of Roman and, and Greek gods, such as Zeus, Apollos, uh, Apollo, and um, so on. And then the city had one of the, the best library at the time, and it had a large theater that could hold 25,000 people. Wow, that's a large theater. See, these are uh, the photos my wife took um, during her uh, Yan Fuk Seminary trip to Greece and Turkey three years ago. See the large theater. Okay, and there's a big row, just like a uh, Nathan row, leading to the theater. Okay, and um, you can you could sit twenty five thousand people there. Wow. And um, also, that's uh, the library, and that's the uh, that's the gate of um, Messieurs. Okay. That's the city center. And then see this long, big road, OK? Just like Park Lane. This road um, on the side, there would be shops um, selling all kinds of um, expensive um, stuff, expensive stuff, just like Park Lane, OK? And see, that's the Temple of Artemis, but um, it's gone now. So there's the there's a model in Turkey, okay, a smaller one, a um, okay, but that's the Artemis Temple. And see see how large it is, and see the steps there and the little people walking up the stairs to into the temple. And that's the statue of Artemis. See um. This statue is full of um, breasts, so it's a goddess of um, fertility. Okay. And um, well, since Ephesus is such a major city in the Roman Empire in Asia at that time, no wonder Paul wanted to visit Ephesus so much, because if the gospel could penetrate such a major city, then the people living in the surrounding region, they would also hear the gospel. And it was a strategic move. Now, when Paul was in Ephesus, he preached every day and he debated with people. And um, let's read this. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away, away to the sick, and their disease left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Wow. Just imagine, okay, I'm holding this paper now, and um, imagine I'm, a, I'm an apostle, and someone took this paper and put it on someone who is sick, and the, and the sickness is gone, the disease is gone. Wow. Extraordinary. And um, these miracles of Paul actually paralleled the miracles um, recorded in Acts chapter 5. And at that time was Peter, Apostle Peter. Peter's shadow also had the power to heal the sick and cast out demon, um, evil spirits. These miracles were signs to confirm Paul and Peter as true apostles who had the uh, authority from God. And notice in the Bible it says, um, it was God doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, such that even his handkerchiefs and aprons could heal people. Now here we see that God knows Paul, okay? God, Paul is known by God through Jesus such that the power of the Holy Spirit works through Paul, okay? And when people see the extraordinary power of God through Paul, they would come to hear Paul's message and get to know Jesus, right? And that's 
how people get to know about Jesus at that time. Now we should, um, well, just uh, uh, just um, to answer, maybe some of some of us would ask, "Hey, why aren't we seeing all these miracles nowadays?" Okay. Now we should know that it was a special time when Christianity was beginning, and miracles happened to distinguish it from the false religions such as Artemis. When the gospel had penetrated a, re a region, the miracles would cease in order that the people didn't get that distracted from the real message of the gospel. Remember when Jesus fed 5,000 people and the crowd kept following Jesus? And what did Jesus say to them? Jesus said to the crowd, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate and you ate your fill of the loaves. So people were looking for food instead of eternal life. And that's why miracles after a while could distract people from the real message of the gospel. And Jesus said, do not work for the fruit that perishes, but for the fruit that endures to eternal lives. That's why when miracles had done their job of showing the authority of the apostles, they fade into the background. And that's why we don't see much uh, miracles around us today. Well, but um, God still do miracles when missionaries enter some tribal areas, when Miracles are needed, but um, they are scarce nowadays. So, know God and then know the power. <laughs> now, <clears throat> what about know Him? Okay, this is N O N O. Then, know power. Now, it was during the time when Paul was in Ephesus, some itinerant Jewish exorcists came to Ephesus. You know, you know what a, an exorcist is, yes? Have you seen the movie Exorcist? You know, the Catholic priest was doing all his all this um, thing. Oh, the ghost come out of that girl, you know, and then he was attacked by the girl. Okay, these are exorcists trying to cast demons out of a person. Through these people, we learn that no him, that is, no real relationship with Jesus, then no power. Now here is the passage we just read a while ago, and I won't read it again. Okay. But notice these people are, okay, um, seven sons of a Jewish high priest. High priest. Wow. Um, by the name Skiver, okay, or Siever, I don't know how to correct it, correctly pronounce his name, okay. And then um, notice the question, here's the evil spirit said to them, Jesus I know and Paul I recognize, but who are you? Well, hence um, the title of my message, know him and know you, okay? The evil spirits, they know Jesus, they know Paul, but do they know you? Now in those days, there were in fact many exorcists in the Roman Empire, and many of them were Jews. Josephus, a Jewish historian at that time, he had recorded some Jewish exorcists successfully cast out demons in the presence of Caesar, the emperor of Roman, of Rome, okay, and Philo of um, Alexandria. He also recorded Jewish exorcists casting out demons, and also some Dead Sea Scrolls describe the way they perform exorcism. Now, four square kilometer of uh, Ephesus is really not that big. So these seven sons of Skiver, they probably saw 
Paul in action, casting out demons in the name of Jesus. When they saw it, they must be amazed. Why this man named Paul? He had such great power that he could cast out demons without setting out any altar. Now we have no exorcists in those days. They would appeal to different gods to cast out evil spirits. And the more gods, the better. Since there would always be one that work, or so they thought. The Gentile exorcists, they would appeal to Zeus and Artemis and other mighty Roman gods such as uh, Hercules or uh, Poseidon, you know. And, but the Jewish exorcists, they most commonly use the name of, do you know who? Who was the wisest person in the Bible, in Old Testament? Solomon, yeah, that's it. Because according to, the, to their legend, many of the spells they used to cast out demons were secretly passed down by Solomon. It's such a good name to use, right? <laughs> now these guys, they were seven sons of a Jewish high priest. So, okay, there's no record of Sceva from other sources. So he might be a high priest without actual duties. As the sons of a high priest, their magical power is believed to be higher. So these seven guys, they are probably well known in the ex exorcism circle. And um, they perform, they would set up an altar, light up candles and um, put the by put the Bible on the table and then um, cast out demons through some ritual. Mm -hmm. So on this day, they set up an altar and held a ritual as usual to cast out evil spirits. They surrounded the demon-possessed man, lit the magical herb, and let the smoke attack the demon-possessed man. And the demon struggle. <laughs> refusing to come out. So they read Psalm 91 three times according to Solomon's instruction. And they chanted Solomon's secret incantation. And the demon continued. <laughs> okay, still not coming out. Okay, now I order you to come out in Solomon's, ma in Solomon's name. And the demon goes, rrr, rrr. okay, still not coming out. Now, let's try another name. Well, didn't we see the other day this guy named Paul used the name of Jesus? Let's try that. Now, we command you to come out by the name of Jesus that Paul proclaimed. Now, suddenly, the demon stopped. And the demon looked puzzled. And the demon said to them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And then, like the monster in Resident Evil, he jumped on, he jumped on Sariah, grabbed him, beat him, and torn his clothes. And the others quickly ran over to pull him away, and he immediately jumped on Pashur, and grabbed him, and beat him, and torn his clothes. And the others ran over again, and he jumped on Amariah, you know, and until everyone was attacked and the crows were tattered. And that they could barely snatch the door and escaped. Wow, what a scene. Sometimes I like how the Bible records this, you know. This events is look almost so comical, so dramatic. And um, sometimes it's humorous. But the evil sp Okay, that's, uh, that's a movie scene. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, notice the demons say, Jesus I know, Paul I recognize, but who are you? In this sentence, there are two words um, that we ought to pay attention to. No 
and recognize. Okay, now the Greek word is ginosko. That refers to the knowledge of someone with understanding based on a personal relationship. And the Greek word for recognize is epistemai, which refers to a certain kind of cognition, recognition in the mind. So for example, I epistemai Biden, Joe Biden. That means I know his existence and what he does as the US president. But if someone says, I ginosko Biden, that person would be someone who has actual contact with Biden. Well, maybe his bodyguard, maybe his family member, or even a re Republican candidate like Donald Trump. <laughs> they may be fighting each other, but Trump knows Biden personally. Okay, although it's not a, they, they seem to be not in a good relationship. <laughs> or you can say, I epistemize Carrie Lam, the CEO of Hong Kong. Now, okay. That is, you have seen, heard, and read about her in the newspaper, on TV, on the radio, or through the internet. But if you say, I ginosko Carrie Lam, then you may be someone working inside the government headquarters, like Raymond did. <laughs> Raymond actually knew Carrie Lam, <laughs> Ginosco Carrie Lam. And um, or, uh, a family member of her or a legislator who debated her in the legislative council. And so the evil spirit said it knew Ginosco Jesus. Isn't that amazing? And evil spirit, Ginosco Jesus. Apparently, Jesus, he was the son of God. He was known throughout the domain of the devil. Remember the Gospel of Mark? The Gospel of Mark records um, that as soon as Jesus met a man possessed by a demon, the demon, what did the demon cried out? The demon cried out, Jesus, son of the living God. The demon knew better than the disciples that Jesus was son of God. During that time, the disciples were still asking each other, well, who is this guy? After they, they have seen Jesus calming the sea and the storm. So sometimes, the evil spirit knows more. <clears throat> now, disciples of Jesus would have received the Holy Spirit. So any, any evil spirits, they would recognize immediately the disciples' relationship with Jesus. Now, I have heard of um, an account that in a tribal village in Malaysia, the tribal shaman or the witch um, was performing some occult ritual, but the shaman was trying to get some spirit to come on him, but the spirit would not come. Then the shaman recognized some, someone amongst the spectators was a Christian. So he asked, if any of you is a Christian, please leave now. And so the Christian walked away, went, went away, and then the evil spirits came. That's a real story I heard. Okay. Yeah, so if you are a Christian and you have the Holy Spirit, the evil spirit would recognize. Such is the relationship of a disciple and Jesus that even evil spirits would recognize. And that's how the evil spirit recognized Paul, because of Paul's relationship with Jesus. But the seven sons of Sceva, the high priest, okay, they apparently did not have the Holy Spirit because they didn't trust in Jesus. They haven't believed 
the message of the gospel. So, and in fact, they didn't even know who Jesus was. You know, in those days, Jesus was actually quite a common name. Yeah, it was a common name. Quite a lot of people goes by the name Jesus, or actually it's Yesu in Greek. Okay, it's actually a, the Greek version of the Hebrew name Joshua, Joshua, which means God saves. Quite a lot of people goes by that name. And the seven sons of Sceva, they just knew it was some Jesus that Paul talked about, but they had no idea who was Jesus exactly. So such then, the evil spirit had no reason to be afraid of them. Just like if I see an American Navy causing some trouble or chaos in one child, and I go to him and say, I order you to stop immediately or I will report to Joe Biden. Is he going to listen to me? No, of course not, because I have no relationship with Joe Biden, <laughs> okay? <laughs> And here are two lessons. Those who utter the name of Jesus do not necessarily have a real relationship with Jesus. Well, many people may think Christianity is good for their children because kids would learn to behave in Sunday school, or so they think. <laughs> okay. I grew up in Sunday school, and I did all sorts of um, naughty things. <laughs> They may think Jesus was a good person because Jesus always talked about love and forgiveness. They may even get baptized into a church because that would get their children into a good school. And that's very common amongst the Catholics. But if they have not really put their faith in Jesus, believing that Jesus is the Son of God and died on the cross for our sins, and Jesus was resurrected on the third day, then they don't have a real relationship with Jesus, and they have no power. And second, all demons, they know about Jesus, which re reminds us that the enemies of God may have more knowledge of Jesus than many believers. I have seen many online forums and social media attacking Christianity and the church those people are very familiar with the Bible and Jesus and the gospel. And some even study theology, but they are unbelievers and they remain hostile to the gospel of God. Now, let's continue. Know him, that means know Jesus. Then you have true power. It was through the evil spirit and these um, seven sons of Sceva um, that the name of Jesus spread like wildfire. Let's read this. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Also, many of those who were now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices. Now, from this passage, it seems that um, some believers, even after they believed Jesus through Paul's message, they were still practicing magic, occult stuff. Maybe they were still attached to the goddess Artemis, just like uh, many Chinese people they would not easily give up ancestor worship even after they believe in Jesus. Now the events of the seven sons of Sceva awaken them and so they know unless they have a real relationship with Jesus, they are going to be bucked by the evil spirit and they have no real power unless they seriously follow Jesus wholeheartedly. And their response, look at their response. And a number of them who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. 
that is as a testimony, as a witness. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. 50,000. Um, well, in those days, one piece of silver equivalent to one day of salary for a Roman soldier. So if we want to think about, OK, what is that equivalent to um, in today's um, terms? Um, well, let's say the salary of a Hong Kong police officer on average is about $1,200 per day. OK. So 50,000 days of salary would be worth around 60 million Hong Kong dollars. OK. Well, remember, books in those days were valuable assets. OK. It's hard to, um, it's expensive to buy books. OK. Because it's not paper, it's scrolls. OK. And so the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Okay, wow. You may, well, I don't know what you think. Um, if, if I'm one of those people, I would think, oh, um, it's too, it's a sh such a shame. I mean, this book costs so much money. It's better to give to the library or to sell it online. Well, not, no online that time, okay. Sell it to somebody and get some money. But they decided to burn them. Why? Because they understand these things are hostile to the gospel of God, in opposition to God. And the best thing to do would be to make these things disappear altogether. So they burn them. Now that's true repentance. They no longer linger on things <clears throat> that displeases God and did not want others to fall, even at their own expenses. <clears throat> so as soon as these Christians, they make a clean break with things that it displeases God and follow Jesus wholeheartedly, then the power of the gospel multiply and, death and see the church, the word of the Lord continue to increase. That's when the power of the gospel would come out. So you know Jesus. <clears throat> that means have a true relationship with Jesus. And then you would have true power. Now remember the pineapple story that um, Reverend Joshua Lamb talked about last week? Yeah, you took the missionary Otto Conning all those years to figure out his relationship with Jesus and his relationship with the tribal people. And once he got that figured out, he gave up his claim. He gave up his claim to the pineapples. That means he was willing to give up his, you know, um, properties, his um, assets, and let God have them. Once he did that, God's power began to work, and the tribal people started seeing Jesus through Otto Conning. And the gospel started to have its way, and the tribal people started coming to Christ. <clears throat> so, in conclusion, true power comes from a real relationship with Christ. You won't have any power if you are just <clears throat> baptized into a religious church. You only have true power if you have a true relationship with Christ. <clears throat> yeah, remember I grew up as a, as a child, as a fourth generation Christian. I went to church with my father and mother, but um, I didn't have any true rela relationship with Christ and I was always worried, always um, wondering, okay, do I really, well, I was always scared of going to hell, you know. But um, I grew up, and then I truly got to know Jesus and trust in him. And then I had a true relationship with Christ, and then the power of the gospel worked in my life, and I had the joy and peace in 
within me that I know, okay, I'm in good terms with God, and I have the assurance of um, eternal life. Amen? Yep. But also, we have to know Jesus well and reject things that are hostile to God, like those, those people in Ephesus, they did, and follow Christ wholeheartedly. <clears throat> and then the power of Christ, the power of the gospel, would manifest in our lives. Let's pray together. <clears throat> well, dear God, our Father, we thank you because you are not only the giver of life, you also want to have a relationship with us. And God, we thank you that you have given us eternal life and also this power through the gospel of Jesus that we not only can, um, can have no fear because of um, because of the salvation of Christ, but we can also enjoy a an abundant life that only Jesus, that only a true relationship with Jesus can give, and that we can have the power to go through any struggle in life. So Lord, grant to us deeper understanding deeper relationship with Christ that we may have a more abundant life in Jesus. And we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat>